So I will try to give a bit of a more fundamentally oriented talk, and I'll uh, try to um, describe our, uh, our work uh, and my work at RMIT as a research fellow on simulating um, lattices on photonic chips using synthetic dimensions. I sit now. I'll do it this way. Uh, so I will start off with a brief introduction of the what, uh, why, and how of synthetic dimensions, um, and then briefly overview how they are typically uh, realized in specifically photonics, and then just um, go over our uh, work on lithium niobate uh, based uh, systems for these sort of phenomena, and the work was done at RMIT's MicroNano Research Facility and Northern Center for Nano Publication. Um, so, synthetic dimensions by de are defined as a way to emulate a spatial coordinate by some non-spatial variable. Uh, I would give an example of, as you imagine, um, pointer. Uh, a basic atom lattice, they're arranged in some specific fashion and the properties we expect from a lattice are derived by the interaction between the sides. Uh, however, um, it is not really the, the placement that is relevant, only the interaction. So we care about the interaction between the states, not exactly where they are located in real space. Um, if we can engineer interactions as we wish, we can have any uh, physical position um, realizing different lattices like one dimensional chain or 2D square lattice. And critically, these types, uh, states can be co-located on a single device. And that is the underlying idea behind synthetic dimensions. The why of it, is that it grew up along uh, the recent decade worth of interest in topological science um, and most wave-related physics fields were pursuing similar phenomena to the quantum Hall effect where you have uh, protected edge states with unidirectional propagation and photonics is no exception. Of course, a photonic benchtop uh, as well as a photonic chip is typically 2D and you can go a bit beyond that with great expense and effort. Um, however, like, where can we get more uh, dimensions, where can we borrow it? And there is some space inside the photon as well, so we can borrow some of, his, some of its uh, properties. And what is specifically important in our work is the frequency. Why? Because we like ring resonators. Because they have a mode structure that is equidistant, and uh, that makes it very easy to bridge um, those states uh, by some external perturbation, uh, such as uh, electro-optical modulation. Um, then, and this sort of a, a set of modes is very similar to a tight binding lattice model uh, where you have lattice sites along which a particle can be hopping along one direction or another and the ways you can model this type of uh, system in photonics is either by having a, a group of cavities uh, interacting evanescently, so again placement or uh, by harnessing the different states in that resonator and co connecting them together by a perturbation so that is the synthetic dimension approach and both of them have advantages and disadvantages. Conceptually, it's very simple to have uh, your, um, all, all your lattice splayed out on a device. Uh, however, if you want com complex interactions, it can get out of hand rather quickly. Uh, on the other hand, synthetic dimensions allows you to have arbitrary complexity on a single device, but you pay for it with enhanced performance requirements for your devices. And you can, of course, mix and match different approaches uh, as you see fit. Um, so most of the pioneering work uh, in this sort of field in photonics was done using optical fiber loops. Um, they uh, are good for devices up to like two rings. Um, and the, the key advantage of fiber loop setups is that um, you can rapidly assemble high performance off the shelf telecom components. Uh, you mix and match them to get best results. Uh, but the downside is that your optical paths are typically on the order of meters. That makes them susceptible to perturbations. So if you want to <coughs> chain together multiple rings, you, everything will get um, uh, disrupted rather quickly. Uh, and that is the key motivation behind uh, the desire to go on a chip. And my introduction to this field was creating a silicon and insulator, CMOS foundry based uh, ring resonator that would be kind of a synthetic frequency dimension device like this. And we uh, devised a design in Japan, uh, we sent it over to a foundry, we got it back at, back at design. It, w uh, it worked as well as it could have, but uh, the key is that high speed modulators in silicon are not particularly efficient and they have quite large losses. Um, so enter lithium niobate and the NN ANFF. Um, if you want a modulator, there's not really any much better than you can do than lithium niobate, especially in its thin film form. And uh, uh, the 
facilities that we need to develop our own processes because this is not a CMOS standard material. You can't, oh, maybe you can now, but back in the day you could not really, a couple of years ago, you couldn't really buy a service. So uh, the, the MCN and uh, uh, Micro Nano Research Facility at MIT allowed us to develop our own process. We use a silicon nitride loading approach. Uh, we don't etch directly the lithium lambing material, and the waveguides are about one micron across and look something like this. Uh, the device concept is a fairly long um, ring resonator. The, the length is because we want to be able to modulate at a frequency that matches the optical round trip duration. So, um, and the high speed and broadband uh, traveling wave modulator done el electro optically in lithium ion. Um, the device is shown here. I will not talk about fabrication. Jamie, who will follow me, will be talking a bit more about that. Uh, but this is the device. It's kind of it's fairly long, not uh, 10 meters. Uh, but not five millimeters like it was in silicon. It's uh, somewhere around ten millimeter uh, round trip, and uh, some uh, sections of the, the, the figure, figure are highlighted. Uh, and key here is that we get uh, equidistant mode lattice, uh, which is good. And the mode la and the lattice of these modes is spaced in frequency around ten gigahertz, which is also good. We can bridge that with modulation uh, rather easily. And uh, when we pump one specific sight on that cavity and switch on modulation, what we see is a random walk of photons from the pumping site away from uh, the, 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 the pumping position. And that is effectively a, a simulation of a random walk in a 1D type by lattice. And if we use uh, integer multiples of uh, the modulation frequency, what we get is just different ways to repartition the chain of resonances uh, in the ring resonator. What was key is selecting the device parameters such that we could uh, measure transmittance of these devices in real time. So we have the spectral domain and the temporal domain. You can see how the resonance of the ring is changing over time uh, on a picosecond scale as you drive the modulator at different frequencies. Um, and if one selects uh, one uh, optical round trip duration here, it is a situation that is curiously similar to the tight binding model dispersion relationship. Uh, which is no coincidence because indeed the uh, uh, inverse space for frequency is time. So you, uh, by having energy versus time, you have the dispersion relationship uh, off the bat. Um, the another, I will not go into too much detail here, but the dispersion relationship is a good way to characterize what type of interaction you are actually modeling. And by mixing and matching different modulation frequencies, you can uh, kind of play around with the connectivity of your uh, ring resonator and, mod and create different lattice models like this triangular sort of ladder that has a uh, phase difference between modulation signals defining a kind of simulated magnetic field for photons. Um, it's just a real life phase. And again, uh, different connectivities model different lattices. This is sort of a tube, and this is a more interconnected tube. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, just a tight binding model is not particularly interesting. I mentioned topology in the beginning, and there's nothing topological about a single band model. Uh, to get something that is sort of topological, one needs to break some symmetries. And the most fundamental one is just to create an uh, alternating strength coupling. Um, strong, weak, strong, weak between uh, lattice pairs. And that's the Sushita Hager model in 1D. And that forces the change in the basis of the lattice. And you get uh, a band gap opening. You can have two bands, which is uh, some chiral, it has some chiral properties. Uh, how one does that in photonics is by using two rings instead of one. You, know, you make a photonic molecule. In essence, what happens here is that you are uh, hybridizing the two rings through strong coupling, they disrupt each other's field, and you have binding anti binding states that kind of split the resonance. And so you have, again, the two different coupling ranges with frequency, and you can drive them with different frequencies to get um, a different coupling situation. Uh, the a device prototype is shown here. So these are two, two uh, rings sharing a uh, modulator and, and coupled together rather strongly. We have some heaters right here to tune the two rings into, into resonance with each other. And uh, that's the experimental transmittance, especially proper transmittance here. You can see the staggered coupling modeling our desire to have um, staggered coupling uh, range, at least here, rather well. And uh, once driven and pumped, we get something um, that is close to experimental uh, expectation for a two variants of a dimer and, of course, of the SSH model with some um, additional bands due to limited extinction ratio of the cavities uh, also kind of being highlighted in red. 
And I will not go into detail, but I hope you'll take my word for it that um, the experimental <coughs> results at the top are sort of well modeled by the theoretical calculations for a so somewhat wasi um, SSH lattice. We're still working on this, on characterizing this um, contraction um, further still. Um, but uh, just uh, to conclude, so I, I hope I was able to convey that the, um, there's a worthwhile um, endeavor in trying to shift synthetic frequency dimension modeling devices from fundamental science onto a chip because of the higher scalability that one can achieve. Um, lithium ligase um, is due to its high uh, modulation efficiency and low propagation losses. Uh, even our first prototype was able to severely um, outclass the rather good uh, silicon oil insulator uh, device obtained from a foundry by, by the breadth of the uh, random walk we can kind of have here. Um, and uh, the key advantage of the synthetic dimension approach is that you can reconfigure your lattice connectivity as you see fit uh, on the same structure. You don't have to make different models uh, with different arrangements like you would in the new space. And that uh, even on topology not to build, uh, arrangements can be done by playing with the whole structure of the ring. And I uh, wish to thank my team, uh, especially here, my PhD student who did much of the um, characterization work, our Japanese colleagues who uh, gave us a lot of impetus in pursuing this, uh, the, the direction of research and of course Melbourne Center for Nano Fabrication and RMIT's Micro Nano Research Facility of the ANFF for making it possible for us to, um, to, to, to pursue our work experimentally and fabricate our devices. And I thank you for your attention.